I grew up in the 80s using words like grody and gag me with a spoon and tubular. Right? These are expressions that we don't use anymore because language and verbal communication, like so many other aspects of life, life is a living thing and it changes over time. And, and there are uh, things that we can understand about language that will help us as we try and understand the role of verbal communication and language specifically in the communication process. So let's take a look today at the nature of language and just some fundamental principles that govern our use of language and the development of language. So first of all, we need to understand that language is symbolic. It just represents an idea or an object. It's not magical or anything else. It just, it just represents something else. So if I were to say the words or, or spell out the word tiger, T-I-G-E-R, we would automatically think of this big cat, right? With stripes and things. Not because the word tiger was sent down from on high or has magical qualities, but just because we've agreed in English that the word tiger and the letters when they're put in that order represent this big cat, this beautiful big cat, right? So, um, so that's what we mean when we say language is symbolic, that it just represents um, something else, right? So um, all language is symbolic and all communication really is symbolic. Um, we have the same thing with uh, not just words, but with images as well. So it's not just verbal communication, but when we're driving, we see these things. We know what they mean. They represent something else. Again, they're, they're created by people, but they represent a different idea. And expressions have the same thing. We say Netflix and chill. Even I know what that means, right? It doesn't mean you're going to watch Netflix and just hang out and, and relax. It represents a different idea. Right? So language is symbolic. It's representative of something else. Language is also arbitrary. For the most part, there's no real connection between the, the symbols and what they represent. They're just thrown together. We just create things and it's, it's mostly arbitrary. Now, you know, for example, why do we call a cow a cow? Why is this not called a fork or a car or a light or an airplane? Just because that's what we decided it was going to be called. Somebody back in the day said this is going to be a cow and it's spelled like this and everybody else agreed, right? So, now we call it a cow. It's, it's just arbitrary. There's no real connection between this object or this animal and the word that represents it. Now, this is mostly true. Now, not all language is arbitrary. Uh, sometimes language does represent the thing that it it, it uh, or it's supposed to sound like the thing that it represents, right? So when we see an explosion, we say bang, right? Bang is a word that's supposed to mimic or imitate what that uh, represents. That's what we call onomatopoeia. The same when you when you think of the, the sound that a bee makes when it's flying around, buzz, buzz, buzz. That's an onomatopoeia. It's supposed to sound like the thing that it represents. We saw this all the time back in the day too. If you ever watched the old Batman shows and they'd put up those words on the screen, pow and bang, and those types of words are onomatopoeia. They're supposed to sound like the thing that they are. But for the most part, language is just a randomly connected string of letters or, or image, you know, whatever. It's, uh, it's just symbolic again, and it's mostly arbitrary. Language is also governed by rules. Um, there are specific rules that, that uh, oversee um, the, the use of language and the structure of language and things. So, so some of those different rules include things like phonological rules, which have to do with the way that, uh, that language sounds, the way that the, each letter and the, and the combination of those letters sounds. When I was younger, we actually learned to spell by using something called phonics, which had to do with phonological rules, right? We would sound things out. Apple, A is for apple, apple is app, p, p, l, l. so how do we spell that using those constituent sounds? Uh, because language has those different phonological rules, um, and every language is different in how they, how they use those rules and, and how they develop those rules and what those rules are. Right? But we have these uh, pronunciation rules, essentially, the way that the words are pronounced, um, given the, the different collection of, of symbols and letters that we're using. We also have syntactic rules, which have to do with the way that language is structured. So the way the words show up in a sentence, for example, we could extend this a little bit into grammar. It's not technically grammar, but we could think of what we oftentimes you know, classify this as well, having to do with grammar and punctuation, um, capitalization, things like that. But really it has to do with the structure of words. So um, in English, for example, if we were describing a, a vehicle, we might say the big red car. Those descriptive words, big and red, would go before the noun, whereas in Spanish it would be, the English direct translation would be the car big and red, 
they put those descriptive words after the noun, which in some ways is more logical, but that's not how we do it in English. Um, one famous violator of syntactic rules uh, was Yoda from the Star Wars um, world, right? He was constantly changing the, the, the the structure of, of the sentence and he was violating those syntactic rules uh, one of the things that made him makes him a memorable character so syntax has to do with the structure of language then we also have semantic rules which is essentially um, uh, the meaning behind these words how the different uh, how we use words differently and, and they have different meanings right so uh, you know for example if I, we would where i'm from we call this a pop other places they call it a soda and how do we apply these um, words and, and the meaning of these words, um, they have different meanings, right? If I said pop to somebody who's from a different part of the country, they might not think of this item, right? They would think of something else. Whereas if somebody says soda, I really have to think for a second about what's a soda. Okay, they mean a pop and translate that. But we just have different meanings for different words based on our own experiences. And, and um, so we call things different things. Um, so, for example, uh, uh, one more example is that uh, in southern India, I live in Indiana, but in southern, I live in northern Indiana. I was in southern Indiana at one point, and I mentioned to somebody that my head was getting cold, and they said I should go get my toboggan. Well, to me, a toboggan is a sled that you ride, not a specific kind of sled that you that you use in the snow and things. And, and uh, so I thought, what is a toboggan going to do for me? with having, you know, the top of my head being cold. And uh, I've come to find out when they say toboggan, they meant what I would call a sock hat, or some people call a beanie, right? That, that's what they, that's the word, they, they use the word toboggan completely differently. So the word toboggan has a different meaning for us. Those are semantic rules, how we uh, apply meaning to language. And then finally, we have these pragmatic rules, which is just has to do with how language is used in everyday life. The application of language in a practical sense is pragmatic rules so every language has rules whether you're talking about english spanish pig latin whatever there are rules to that language uh, and they they fall in these categories all kinds of different rules uh, that are established for, for different languages language is also subjective that means that um, it's, it can be slightly different for each person right? so every word has two different types of meaning it has first a denotative meaning, which is what we would call like a dictionary meaning, the dictionary definition of that word. So every word has this. If we were to look it up in the dictionary, what would it mean? So no matter who you are, as long as you you know using the same language and have the same you know, sort of base dictionary, it has that denotative meaning, what it actually means in the in the specific literal sense. Every word though also has this connotative meaning which is more figurative, it's subjective, it's, it's dependent on that person's interpretation and can be different from person to person. Right? So, um, uh, so it has, a, you know, based on your frame of reference, based on your knowledge, your, your experience, your, um, your, your history, your, your, where your culture, all those things go into the blender and make up your frame of reference, which affects how you view a word and what that word specifically means for you. So uh, it, it has to do with your interpretation, and that's where language is subjective. It's it dependent on the interpretation or meaning given to it by that specific person. We can see this represented in uh, Ogden and Richard's semantic triangle, right? And the semantic triangle is essentially just a triangle, uh, but it has those three points, right? And it points to first the symbol itself. So if we were to take a look at the symbol home, this collection of letters, again, it's arbitrary, it's symbolic, but this you know, collection of H-O-M-E, when it's put in that order, makes up the word home. If we were to look that up in the dictionary, we would find that a home you know, in, in English and in, in most English speaking countries would be something like this, it would be a, a building with walls and windows and a door. And it's where you'd live, right? It's a dwelling. It's a structure um, and a building where people live and make their residence. That's the denotative definition. Now, for some people, though, when they think of home, they think of positive things. They think of, you know, that's where their family's at. Home is where the heart is, and that's where things are comfortable and good and safe, right? But we could ask somebody else that same symbol, H-O-M-E, and we would have the same denotative definition. It's a structure. It's a dwelling where you live. But for some people, the word home wouldn't represent those positive, fuzzy things. It would be home is where, you know, people argue. Home is not safe. Home is, um, not such a pleasant uh, environment. So um, it would have a different meaning for that person then, right? So that's the connotative meaning, the subjective meaning for that person. We can take another word just as an example and say baseball. 
right? Then that's a collection of, of letters that creates that symbol. And denotatively, it would mean both the ball and the game. So it would mean a baseball, the ball, it has a specific circumference and weight and so forth. And then the game is one player at bat, nine in the field, three strikes, four balls, and so forth. If we were to look at baseball in the dictionary, that's what we would find. But then when you ask each person, you know, how, what does baseball mean to you? What do you think when you, when you hear the word baseball, what, what meaning does it have for you? Some people would say, it's great. I love baseball. It makes me think of playing baseball as a kid and we're going to watch my kids play baseball. It makes me think of going to the ballpark with my family. It makes me think of positive things. And I love watching baseball. It could be any of those things or some of those things. And other people would say, I hate baseball. It's boring. I don't like going. It makes me think of going to the field and having to spend all day watching somebody else play baseball and so forth. So every person's going to attach a slightly different meaning to the word baseball. That's the subjective connotative meaning. So every word though is subjective. Every word has that connotative meaning. And we need to keep that in mind as communicators that, that the meaning that word has for us could be different for other people. It will have that denotative meaning, but it could have also a different connotative meaning, subjective meaning. Language is also created by and specific to a particular culture. Um, we see this not only in terms of the fact that we have different languages across the world, right? We see that we have English and Spanish and Chinese and, and Swahili and so forth. Um, all these different languages created by and specific to that culture. Uh, that's also true though across time. As we pointed out earlier, English has not remained the same over time here in the United States. Back in the 80s, like I said, we use words like like tubular and grody and expressions like gag me with a spoon that, are, that don't uh, get used anymore, right? They're different now because it was specific to that culture. Here's some other pop slang of the 2000s, for example. We don't use these words really as much anymore, not in a, at least not in something other than an ironic sense. We don't really say bootylicious, or we don't say awesome sauce, which is too bad because I really like that one, but it's it's gone out of style because it was particular to that context and that culture, and it's bound to that, and language changes over time. So now that we have a better sense and a better foundation for language, a better understanding of of the nature of language, we can really start to look at how language impacts us and verbal communication impacts us and, and, uh, and then how we can improve our use of verbal communication and language as communicators. If you have any questions about the nature of language or anything else related to communication, I hope you'll send me an email. I'd really love to hear from you in that way. And in the meantime, I hope that you will consider these principles of language, these, these foundational elements of the nature of language in, in the way that we think about language and the way that we use language as a whole as part of our efforts as a communicator.